All right, Shalom, welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Neil Gordon, who is over the other coast in Brooklyn, New York. How are you doing, Neil? I'm doing good, John. It's good to be here. Yeah, Neil is a persuasion expert who helps experts turn their message into a movement. Uh, he's a former member of the editorial staff of Dutton, now a division of Penguin Random House, and has ghostwritten multiple books for major publishers like HarperCollins and Hay House. And he's been featured in media outlets like Forbes, Fortune, NBC, Fox, KTLA, and has been a VI con VIP contributor for Entrepreneur. And what we're going to talk about today is your persuasion technique that you call i'm forever telling people there are no silver bullets but it sounds like i'm wrong because you have a silver bullet you're going to tell us about <laughs> yeah of course and I'm, I'm aware of that too because <laughs> we hear that often john is like there's no silver bullet for this and there's yeah. no magic pill and all of that and what if there actually is and it's well that's why i'm excited to hear about it because i'm excited we finally found somebody who has one so um tell me a little bit first about how you came to put together a persuasion technique or how did you become to be, how did you end up becoming a persuasion expert? Well, it's funny. You mentioned when in introducing my bio to our viewers and listeners, you mentioned how I worked at Penguin. Yeah. And I wound up getting out of the publishing game pretty early. I was only there for a few years because I was noticing that the co-authors and the ghostwriters who were responsible for, for putting these nonfiction books mm -hmm. together were really pretty subpar and very not persuasive in how they presented their content. Right. And I thought, well, I could probably at least do better than that. And so I didn't have great ambitions to become a persuasion expert. I just wanted to do more writing and focus on more content because publishing book publishing is really a lot about acquisition as opposed to mm -hmm. working on content. So I, I left there. And as I started ghostwriting for the publishers, like you mentioned, like Harper Collins and all of that, I started to notice a pattern. Mm -hmm. And I was watching a lot of TED Talks and I was listening to a lot of other speakers at the time who so the really effective ones, the really exceptional ones fall, fall, fell into this pattern. And then the very not effective ones did not. And the closer I looked at it, the more I realized there is this specific technique that these most effective speakers and authors and other folks are using, but that almost no one else does. It's it's greatly overlooked. Mm -hmm. and what if we started to consciously use this technique in a strategic way to be more persuasive in our sales, in our speaking, in our authorship, and all of the things? Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you think about it. If you watch a TEDx or other things. Um, and you see how how people can get to their message and reinforce it and get and get it to come across very, very quickly. And and it seems economically too. Yeah, because when you think about the TED phenomenon specifically, a lot of these talks they will only give their speakers ten or twelve minutes mm -hmm. to convey something, and that's it. I've even seen TED talks that were shorter than that. And so what if there's a way to really convey something potent and meaningful in such a short amount of time? What if there's a way to do an elevator pitch in under a minute that was significant for the listener? And that's all possible. Yeah, because let's face it, I mean, elevator pitches, people struggle with them all the time. And it's like, mm -hmm. I mean, most people trying to get an elevator pitch that works, you know, you normally would have to have an elevator that goes to the top of the tower in Dubai in order to get it out in the, in, in the length of time that you have. So tell me then a little bit about how you came up with your methodology and what your, and what the basis of it is. To understand what this methodology is, I can actually take us back to the movie Moneyball that starred mm -hmm. Brad Pitt and yep. Jonah Hill, right? You remember that. Sure. And early on, when Brad Pitt's character is struggling to convey the more old school thinking type people in the baseball management, that there needs to be a different way to, to create a team than what we're doing. Because the Oakland Athletics, where he worked, had a much smaller budget than the Yankees and yep. other big teams, big market teams. So he's like, it's an unfair game. How do we solve this? And so then he meets Jonah Hill's character, 
not even a quarter of the way into the movie. And Jonah explains to Brad that there's an epidemic failure to understand what is really happening in this game. Mm -hmm. And he says that most people think you need to buy players, but what you really need to do is buy runs. And in doing this, what Jonah has done is he's distilled everything down to a very simple idea. Moneyball is this big economic theory. And even, I mean, Jonah's character is fictional, but he says he studied economics in Yale. So it sure. implies that there is a lot of complexity and nuance to this system. But what he does in just a handful of seconds is distill it all down to one idea that even if Brad's character never talks to him again, mm -hmm. at least he could start forming his own concepts and ideas about how to utilize that recipe for future success. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's and 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 that's what you just outlined there. I mean, that's the essence of a you know fantastic elevator pitch, fantastic brand position. I mean, right. what do you do? You we we buy runs or we sell runs or whatever. Everybody understands what that is in a right. baseball context. So how how do you help people then in their businesses get to get to something like that? Because I mean, people people struggle to distill, right? I mean, it's easy to come up with word salads and like lovely long streaming streams of consciousness, but distilling down to something like we buy runs or we sell runs is so difficult. Yeah, and it's funny. I've really taken to using that scene in that movie as a way to create a very simple exercise for people because a lot of these folks who are creating these pitches or putting together a talk or a book or whatever, they've been doing what they've been doing for a long time. They've amassed a tremendous amount of information. Mm -hmm. And so there's a real implied challenge in getting it down to something so simple. And what I'd like to say is that contrast creates clarity. When Jonah says what he says, he says, there's an epidemic failure to understand what's really happening. And so, and he also says, they all think that you need to buy players. Mm -hmm. And so what he's doing and this, what this contrast creates clarity concept is meant to lead us toward is to contrast our solution with the solutions that of which we at least approve the ones that we deem epidemic failures. Yep. And so we can say the key to solving this problem is not this thing over here, this failure over here, but rather this over here. And just by, it's not the only way to distill sure. it, but in terms of you and me here talking for a brief period of time, this is the, the go-to way I've found to explain this to folks is just to contrast it with the solutions of which you least approve and then you could start really riffing on that and finding your clarity. Yeah, because I mean, it's even in the obviously in the industry we're in uh, with, yeah. with pipeline or CRM. I mean, we have a we have a rather classic one because we have, you know, the eight hundred pound gorillas in the industry, are like a sales force. Right. Exactly. But people hate, don't like their interface. They get terrible adoption. Um, mm -hmm. They have so many problems, and uh, and that's obviously what you're talking about. Is we tried to contrast ourselves over here with visual, right. easy to adopt, and all of that. Right. Exactly. And so, in looking at Pipeliner's model, there is real potential to create the similar kind of Moneyball-like clarity around perhaps the prominence of the visual elements. Mm -hmm. Right. That maybe there is a powerful analogy in looking at a whole bunch of data as this great big complex spreadsheet and then putting right next to that a very simple chart mm -hmm. and the difference between the all of the listed data and the simple chart is the difference between whether or not you can adopt yeah. a new thing like you guys talk about how you can create you can train on this in only five hours yeah, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. right and so what would really help to sell people on that idea is a silver bullet like statement where you can say the key to mastering and using a CRM effectively is blank or mm -hmm. the more, the, the less you need to figure out in a user interface, the more likely you are to get mm -hmm. effect, become effective in managing your pipeline or whatever it is. There's something sure. like that. A silver bullet is a cause and effect sentence. When you take one action, you get one outcome. Right. Moneyball example is the key to winning at baseball 
is to buy runs. Right. One outcome is winning a baseball and one action is buying the runs. Mm -hmm. And so Pipeliner has that opportunity to create that simple kind of way of differentiating yourself from the sales forces and the hub spots and everything else that's out yeah. there with huge market share. Yeah. And and it's interesting what you say, like the the single, you know, the this the single statement or whatever, the single outcome. And yeah. And it's one thing that we're very bad. Children are great at this. Adults are terrible at it. Is yeah. uh, is that um, if if a kid wants to do something like he wants to go to the theme park because it's got the brand new roller coaster, the most the greatest roller coaster in the world, mm -hmm. they will just keep saying, "I want to go to the park because it's got the greatest roller co coaster in the world." I want to go to this park because it's got the greatest roller coaster in the world. Whatever. Adults, if our first argument doesn't land, we'll then start to add in other other right. supporting reasons for going and all we're actually doing is diluting the art diluting us exactly. diluting our argument rather than enforcing it because now we're giving things multiple things to say no to <laughs> exactly and it's just like diluting it is a very different thing john than distilling it yes diluting it you're watering it down you're giving them four or five or 20 different things to think about and keep track of mm -hmm. which overwhelms the mind and does a very important thing. It convinces the listener that change is not possible mm -hmm. because there's just so much to keep track of. But the flip side of it is, and if someone was curious as to what my silver bullet is, like, well, how do I distill my work? I have several, yeah. of course, but in germane to what we're talking about here, people buy when they believe change is possible. Mm. And distilling everything down in this way is about giving them the simple recipe for success. When they have that recipe, they're like, oh, I get it now. All right. I need is a CRM that I can learn in very little time. And I could utilize the visual elements and, and lean into my visual affinity just to make all of this run much smoother instead yeah. of providing 30 reasons why you need to go with Pipeline or something like yeah. that. It's no, e exactly. And, and what you just said there about, you know, the persuading people that change is possible. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the critical things. And and when you go through, and especially when you're going through a market and a, like we are right now, where it's all kind of up and down, people don't really know, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. What mm. happens is people default into doing nothing, right? Because mm. they just think it's, it's less of a risk. Uh, it's not going to cost us anything. We're not going to make mistakes. So they kind of put that idea of change to the side. Mm. And what you're saying is, you know, you bring it back front and center and go, no, change is possible. And it's not just possible. It's the right time to do it. Right. Right. Exactly. We're getting into a area or a chapter, perhaps, of our culture where it's harder and harder to get people to do something different. Yeah. And, absolutely. and to the point you made earlier, we just wind up compensating for that by just throwing even more stuff at everyone. <laughs> and if we simplify things instead, and we doesn't, it doesn't mean that we're going to attract everyone to our mm -hmm. vision, but those who are attracted are going to be much more powerfully. So because mm -hmm. of that belief that change can happen for them. Yeah. Can you can you give me without naming them with the the companies but can you give me a few examples of where this has worked you know where you, the work you've done with people and the kind of outcomes mm -hmm. that they've seen or the difference that they've seen I love this story of one of my former clients who is an executive coach and he had developed a program a few years ago where he was going to sell it to the Fortune 500 where it's helping mid-level managers to give more effective feedback, right? right? So he's going to pitch to companies like Facebook and Silicon Valley companies and all of that. And they have large budget budgets for professional development, but the problem he's running it, he was running into is that his particular solution on the surface sounds like everyone else's. It sounds mm -hmm. like it's a commodity. And yeah. when you're trying to win at the commodity game, you can only really just compete on price. Yep. Yeah. However, in spending an hour working with him on finding his silver bullet, how to distill all of his program down to an essence, he was equipped for when he had his sales conversations with the HR departments responsible for bringing him on. And they asked him a very important question, John. They said, how are you different? And so he was able to say very succinctly, 
what most programs like mine do is that they blank. Mm -hmm. What we do is blank. And so I spoke to him. This was he he we had this conversation actually right after the pandemic started in 2020, right. 2020. Mm-hmm. And we got in touch about six months later, and he told me his number, which he didn't he didn't make the number publicly available in his testimonial, but what he did say, but the number was very high, and he said in his testimonial he made multiple five-figure deals as a result of that one conversation of having that answer to that question. Mm -hmm. And so this becomes a very powerful tool for a lot of reasons, but when having a sales conversation with someone and they ask you the tough question, it sounds like you do something that a lot of other people do. How are you different? You actually have a rather lucid and powerful answer and response. Yeah, and and no, that's a, that's a that's a, a critical point. And I think what happens a lot of the times is is that is that we people don't do enough of that work up front, right? They just try, mm. you know, they sort of they've got a few kind of differences, and they just go out to market, and they hope that for some reason that you're going to figure out that they're because you're new or you're a little bit different. But yeah. but but a lot of people don't put in that work to get that real clarity. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing to say in response to what you just said, John, is that novelty is certainly good for getting attention and all of that. And especially when it comes to a SaaS platform Mm -hmm. and there's a new thing and how many millions of people adopted chat GPT as soon as it was released in the market and all of that. But in the longer term, people aren't ultimately going to buy because of that which is novel and that which is different in the moment. They'll continue to buy or they'll buy further down the road because, like I said, they believe that they can create meaningful change with the help of that. Mm -hmm. That is, at the end of the day, what happens? Novelty fits into that in a way because, well, it's different, so maybe it'll work better than the other things have. But at the end of the day, it's really the belief that change is possible. And you can take the oldest, most classic solution to something and find a new way of positioning it. And that becomes a way to really resonate in the marketplace. Yeah, no, and absolutely. And and I think that, and, and we're going through this weird phase now because with AI mm-hmm. and all of that is, I, I mean, this is the first time I've ever seen where you, know, you can start using a tool one week and then the next week you go, oh, there's a new tool. That's a better yeah. one. I'll use this one instead. Yeah. So people are constantly switching. And uh, and to your point, though, at some stage, you have to make sure that whatever your product or service is, that it has some kind of anchor and, mm-hmm. and some kind of like value proposition that you can hang your hat on so that you're not people aren't going to bounce. Exactly. Exactly. And when you communicate that in like a product demo or mm-hmm. in some kind of other, like a video sales letter or webinar, if you can convey that up front, you'll not only help with your, it'll not only help with their conversion, but when people understand why the methodology or the solution is the way it is, they're more likely to stick with it. They're mm-hmm. going to understand that there's a larger significance and there's, there's gold at the end of the rainbow. Yeah. And I think the the last the last part, Neil, is just that that level of authenticity. You have to really I mean, it has to be true, number one. And mm-hmm. you have to really believe in it and believe in what you're doing, because I think the antennas are up nowadays for inauthenticity or people are yeah. are kind of predisposed to think that you're going to be pulling the wool over their eyes or it's only really going to do 50 percent of what you say it's going to do. So yeah. I think I think building being authentic and building trust is is still like the, the critical currency. It really is. I would even argue, John, that trust is more important than knowing and liking. Yeah, it's like you can convert someone pretty quickly these days who's just wanting to try something. They don't know or like you necessarily, but if they mm-hmm. can trust what you say, which is what this kind of persuasion approach can help to make happen, then you'd be surprised what, what people will say, like how quickly people will say yes, just like mm-hmm. I described with my client. Yeah, no, absolutely. And when you go through these periods of uncertainty in the market or whatever, where people are reluctant to make uh, to make changes or to make choices, even that trust factor is is sometimes the only thing that gets you over the line. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. It really does ultimately make a difference in the long term. Mm-hmm.
Well, this has been fantastic. All of Neil's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Well, a lot of my people find me through solving public speaking related problems. Like I have this massive talk coming up and I have no idea what I'm going to say. And I really need to land this because it could mean a lot of really warm leads and possibly even some other speaking opportunities. And so that's one of the main things I help people to do. And I still work with people on their books and all of that, but the truly exciting work is when my clients have to pitch something for funding or otherwise right. put together some kind of webinar where they're just looking to get a better conversion rate. And so that's, that's the exciting area that I've been exploring more and more in recent times. Excellent. Well, I would encourage you to go go check out Neil's work, and uh, you know, like get this. And he is a silver bullet. So I mean, you can, he's going to help you find your silver bullet, and you're going to be able to tell people, I actually do have a silver bullet. So I encourage you to go check it out. All right, listen. Thanks again, Neil. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again very soon.